Hello everyone, what I'd like to show you today is the relationship between planetary alignments and sea levels. And I've heard it said that if there's any relationship between planetary alignments and earthquakes, we should also see it in sea levels. And guess what? You do. So let's scoot over to the, uh, the NOAA website, the National Data Boy Center. And as you can see on their map, uh, they've got buoys all through the Northern Pacific, the Central Pacific, the Southern Pacific, a few, and the Indian Ocean, and then a lot more again in the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, what I'd like to show you first is this one in Bermuda. And the reason for that is because it's a very good example of the moon sun alignment causing the highest high tides and the lowest low tides. Okay, if we click on that link, you can see this is uh, data showing about four days uh, worth of sea levels taken every 15 minutes. We can go over to the actual page and you can see the same chart. Well, let's uh, pop in some data here covering about one and a half years, or just over a year. And as you can see, you can pull all that data up into one chart here, which hasn't still taken a while to load. Oh, there we go. But it's very hard to see the actual details in that chart, and that's what we'd like to be able to see, is the actual details. I tried to put it onto a spreadsheet, and this is what it looked like. And one thing you'll notice is when you have the highest highs, you also have the lowest lows, and when you have the lowest highs, also the highest lows. So I was thinking well, that's interesting. Uh, it's sort of what you'd expect I guess. So what I decided to do is plot these on the charts and if you look at this chart here this is just showing you the highest highs. Uh, just showing the highs of the day. The highest high on every 24-hour period day by day. And if we were to subtract, if we take look at this chart, if we were to subtract the, the low from the highest high on every one of these days, we actually get something that looks very similar, like this. Okay, and if you can see, well we can't show them both at the same time, the patterns are a little bit, jumps around a bit here, but you can actually see it quite clearly here. When you're just looking at the the traction of the lowest lows from the highest highs. And this is what this maximum minus minimum stands for. Okay, so what we're looking at here, the buoy uh, in Bermuda, this one here. Okay, which is the one we're looking at here, of course, and here. Okay, so the reason why, well, you don't have to look at the maximum minus minimum. You can see the same pattern here. We'll look at it without the maximum minus minimum first. And what you can see, if we show the sun-moon alignment here, you can see the sun-moon alignment, this full moon, aligns pretty good with these peaks. There's a pretty good correlation between the sun-moon alignment with the full moon and these highest high tides. The other high high tides is actually on the new moon. In fact, it's even a better or higher peaks are caused by the new moon which is this point here where the sun and moon are zero degrees apart okay and the, of course the full moon is when they're 180 degrees apart so on the new moon and full moon we get these very clear peaks okay so this is a good example of uh, the sun moon alignment affecting the tides and if we look at the maximum minus minimum it comes even clearer because we get a you eliminate a lot of the variations which or randomness might occur during the day and it actually become, makes a nice smoother much smoother curve okay so the next lot of the sea level data we'd like to show you is actually coming from the south pacific in this case the chatham islands which is near the coast of new zealand okay the chatham islands themselves are actually on the edge of the submerged continent called zealandia now unfortunately the uh, NOAA don't actually have any, uh, the NOAA database doesn't actually have any buoys down on the Chatham Islands. But we can actually get some information from the University of Hawaii from their website, and that is actually what I've been using here. So we're looking at uh, the last six years, and of course there's gaps in the data, but we're looking at the last six years worth of data, and, and all together I actually managed to get ten years worth of data. So let's zoom in and some into the, some of this data and have a look and see if it correlates with uh, the sun and moon. Well, it doesn't really correlate at all. 
it actually looks like the sun and moon alignment moves in and out of phase all the time with the sea level data. Okay, but we can clean that up a little bit by using the maximum and minimum, maximum minus minimum, and we can see here, well, at times it looks good and at other times it's just completely wrong. Well, interestingly enough, we can actually use the moon Jupiter alignment and we find a perfect match. Now you've got to perhaps come up with an explanation as to why there's a perfect match, but it's, un it's an undeniable correlation here between uh, this, the moon and Jupiter alignment and sea levels in the Chatham Islands. And this goes on for years and years. So how is it possible that the Moon and Jupiter have such a massive influence on the sea levels in the South Pacific, especially around the Chatham Islands? After all, Jupiter is so far away from the Earth relative to the distance from the Earth to the Sun, and Jupiter is so small compared to the size of the Sun. And yet we can see this influence between Jupiter and the Moon and the sea levels. Could it possibly be Jupiter's magnetic field, which is acting on the southwestern edge of the Pacific Plate and moving that up and down and causing this uh, rise and fall in sea levels. Or perhaps it's an electric field coming from Jupiter. I don't know. But it certainly deserves further investigation. So if the Moon-Jupiter alignment is having such a significant effect on sea levels in the South Pacific near to where the Pacific Plate is subducting under the Australian Plate, is it possible we can see something similar in the North Pacific, near to where the Pacific Plate subducts under the Eurasian Plate? Well, as an example, let's have a look at the data from this boy here. And this is what it looks like. We've got data going from the end of 2007 up until a few days ago. So let's zoom in on some of this data. And let's first try the Sun-Moon alignment. After all that worked in the Atlantic, and no, it doesn't work here. You can see there's no correlation between the Sun, Moon, or no obvious correlation between the Sun, Moon alignment and the sea levels. Or how about the Moon Jupiter alignment? After all, it works in the South Pacific. And again, there's no obvious correlation, in fact, there's no correlation at all between the Moon and Jupiter and the sea levels in the, near the edge of the northwestern Pacific Plate. So, it turns out we can actually take uh, the Orion alignment and this is actually taking Betelgeuse as the position in the constellation of Orion for this alignment and we actually get quite a nice correlation that goes on throughout the whole data. We've got data back here we can have a look at that. Okay, it's because it's spike, we've got a few spikes here we can clean this up a bit by looking at the maximum and minimums. Maximum minus minimum. Okay, and as you can see, there's a very good correlation all the way back to as much data as we've got. Now what could this be? How is it possible that Orion and the Moon alignment could be causing such a significant movement in sea levels? And it's very similar to what we see with the Sun-Moon alignment in that when the Moon and Orion are zero degrees apart in the sky, we actually get the highest peaks. It doesn't work for the whole period. I think towards the end of this year, or this part of the year, it's actually we're getting a lower peaks. But it's an interesting thing there, which I'll just quickly mention. It actually turns out to be when the Sun and Moon are in phase with this Orion alignment, we get the highest peaks. And as we move back a bit, you see they're moving out of phase, we get lower peaks. When these, the Sun-Moon alignment and the Moon-Orion alignment are out of phase, we actually get lower peaks. So the Sun does have an influence here, but it's not the dominant influence. It's just causing this phasing pattern. And if I zoom out, you can see this pattern. I'll take away this. These points here 
are actually when the moon, a sun moon alignment and the moon Orion alignment move out of phase. And when they're in phase is when you get the highest peaks or when they're 180 degrees out of phase. So it's not like the sun doesn't have any influence, it still has an influence, but it's not the significant, it's not the dominant influence. So, what could this be? How is it possible that Orion, which is so far away, could possibly have any influence over the sea levels on the northern Pacific? To try and answer that question, let's have a look at exactly where the moon was in the sky when we had the highest peaks around the point of this uh, moon Orion alignment. Okay, so we're looking at an hourly chart here of the same sea level data, and the highest peak in February of this year occurred on February 14 at 2100. So let's pull up Stellarium and go to February. 14, oops, 2100. And here's the moon, and here's Orion. And here's Betelgeuse, which is where we're taking our alignment. And as you can see, that peak occurred slightly after the exact alignment. Okay? Between Betelgeuse, that is. So, it's somewhere, it would appear to be something in this vertical line here. Somewhere along this vertical line could be where this object is that's causing this peak in sea levels. Okay, so let's move on and have a look in March, see if it's something similar. I get the highest peak in March. Oops, we're still in February. Okay. Okay. So the highest peak in March, I'll move it on a little bit more, just to be sure. Highest peak in March was March 14 at 1900. Okay, March 14 at 1900. And we're slightly left of where we were in February, but it's somewhere, it would appear to be somewhere along here. So perhaps between the two, somewhere between those two points. Let's have a look at the most recent alignment between, or near alignment between Orion and the Moon. And we can see that on perhaps it was July 28 or July 29. It looks actually closer to July 28. We're only talking about a few millimeters, but I think it would take it as July 28 at 10 a.m. Okay, let's pull up Stellarium, July 28 at 10 a.m. And there we have it again. Get back to the minute. So, somewhere to the left of Orion is something which is causing these high tides. And well, Stellarium is just a star chart, it's just a planetarium program. These are only simulations of stars. So why don't we have a look for this object in Google Sky. Here's Google Sky. Let's get find Orion. Search. Well, I guess we've got to click on it. Okay, we're looking at Orion here. Okay, there's Orion's belt, and we're looking for the left hand side of Orion, somewhere along here. Oh, and what do we have? Let's zoom out from that square. We're on the left hand side of Orion, about down from where the moon was in our image. Right, let's choose a date. Can we choose a date? I don't think we can on this. 
we got a blocked out square. Okay, that would seem to be the same longitudinal position of whatever it is affecting sea levels on the northwestern Pacific plate at the edge of the subduction plate. Very, very interesting. Okay, thank you for watching. Please leave your comments below. See you next time.